Thank you, Dan. I especially appreciate in the introduction you talked about philosophy being in the Agora, not just in the Ivory Tower. Uh, I am in no sense an academic philosopher. Uh, We had some philosophy classes together. But uh, I broadly construed, you might say, I'm interested in the project of practical philosophy, sort of taking uh, uh, thinking straight and applying it uh, to the workaday world, uh, indeed, as a sort of Uh, intellectual self-defense to keep folks from being beguiled by hucksters and scam artists, etc. That is not the topic of my uh, talk tonight, however. Uh, As Dan mentioned, as Professor Dimitriou uh, mentioned, uh, I've spoken at a number of colleges and universities across the uh, uh, country, and the great thing about where you're at right now is that you're in this, like, golden age of your life, uh, trust me when I say this, where you have an opportunity to ask questions that it may be hard to ask later on when you're working your nine to five and you know, raising a family and saving for retirement and all, all of that stuff. Um, uh, you know, the conversations maybe that we're going to have tonight, the conversations that we just had, I just had a meeting with the philosophy club and a class on was it uh, Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud? Those kinds of conversations are what college is all about. But sadly, there are some folks who disagree with that being the point of university. There are folks who say, hogwash, you should go to school instead uh, to get training, to get a good job, sort of turn every university into a vocational, uh, like a, a, a tech school or something. There's nothing wrong with getting training. Uh, uh, but uh, there's something beautiful about, you know, 100 plus people showing up for a discussion on ethics, you know, uh, that, uh, and this is an opportunity you have right now at college that you won't ordinarily have. A number of years ago at Middle Tennessee State University, we, uh, uh, I was involved in a series there on topics like we're going to talk tonight, but, it's, but more centered around the existence of God. And we were sponsored by like the philosophy department and a local free thought group and all of that. And there was a community outcry. Uh, the local churches and some other organizations and some prominent opinion leaders of the local town said, look, this isn't why we sent our kids to college. We didn't send them there to question their cherished beliefs. We sent them there to get an education sort of in line with uh, what we already uh, believe. The editorial board of the student newspaper, so these are college students writing this, disagreed with that line. They said, no, that's not what college is about. They said, and I quote, and I loved this quote, they said, the reason we're here at college is to immerse ourselves in original new ideas and subject ourselves to diverse arguments. Every student should attend at least one lecture that differs from his or her current beliefs. And if those beliefs can't stand under scrutiny, the editorial board, these students said, those beliefs aren't worth having. Now, those are fighting words, but I buy them. So if, you, if you, your sense of your place in the universe or your ideas about right and wrong or your ideas about metaphysics or God or uh, other central and cherished beliefs can't stand under scrutiny, Uh, that might suggest uh, that they're not worth having. I agree with that editorial board. The goal of the university is to promote free, unfettered, critical inquiry into every area of human endeavor. That's what a classical liberal arts and science education is all about. No questions off limits. No issues are taboo. Academic freedom is when a professor can ask uh, untimely questions, controversial questions, challenge the status quo. And you're, by being here tonight, engaged in that process. Um, You know, that's one of the things I think this philosophy series is all about. And, uh, you know, being open to questions, being willing to hear things you might disagree with, I think is a noble pursuit in and of itself. Doesn't mean you have to jettison everything you believe. It means that you should engage in that great conversation. That's what we're here to do tonight. Now, We're here to do that tonight, but there are a lot of institutions in society that engage in this sort of project, you know, educating people uh, to think straight about uh, certain views. There are scientific institutions that challenge widely held beliefs. There are 
uh, colleges and universities is w one type of institution, but there's also science centers, there are educational nonprofits, museums, planetaria. Why do all these institutions exist? Because the project we're engaged in actually benefits society. It forwards our thinking about these important points of view. Before I get into my discussion on ethics, I think it's only fair that I tell you a bit where I'm coming from these days. Uh, as Dan mentioned, I am president of the James Randi Educational Foundation, founded some 17 years ago by the magician and the public intellectual James Randi. If you go on YouTube, you'll see hundreds of videos viewed by millions of people of Randy, like going on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson and exposing psychic surgery, which was a scam practice that uh, Peter Sellers or uh, Andy Kaufman, two celebrities, when they had cancer, rather than going to an oncologist, they went to a psychic surgeon, which was just a magician pretending to reach in their bodies and take out diseased organs, but they were just doing magic tricks. So Randy, for decades, decades and decades, has used his background in magic to expose charlatans and frauds, um, what Randy calls woo-woo. Uh, so he sort of wants that adopted in the dictionary. Start using that word, please. Woo-woo, those unsupportable claims that uh, if you believe in them, they could actually hurt you. Um, here's quick background about what we do at the JREF, as we call it, the James Randi Educational Foundation. We publish a lot of books for the iPad, Kindle, and Nook on these sorts of topics. Some of them are free. You can get them uh, for free by going to randy.org. We offer uh, resources for high school and junior high teachers uh, get this, exploring topics in the paranormal, these spooky claims, ESP, ghosts, psychic powers, astrology, etc., to teach the methods of science and the best ideas in psychology about uh, thinking straight and about cognitive biases. Notice one's called, Do You Have ESP? It's not entitled, There Ain't No Such Thing as ESP. It's an open-ended inquiry where students for an hour in their high school or junior high class go through an experiment in, uh, during the process of which they learn something about investigative methods and in, uh, experimenter bias and methods of science, et cetera, but they're engaged because of these topics. Cottingly Ferries, this um, uh, Arthur Conan Doyle uh, hoax, he was probably hoaxed he, uh, himself, but uh, tur turn of the 19th century, uh, the belief that a couple girls in uh, England actually found fairies in their backyard ended up just being cardboard cutouts and early uh, versions of Photoshop. But it was a widespread belief in actual fairies uh, widely adopted in the United Kingdom. And that experiment for high school and junior high students explores the role of celebrity in fostering uh, uncritically um, uh, uh, unsupportable belief. Uh, we have uh, classroom kits on dowsing where students learn how to make dowsing rods and learn whether or not dowsing rods work. Do you guys know what these dowsing rods are? You know, um, your great uncle or your grandpa might do water witching in the backyard using sticks to find uh, water. Now it seems like a trivial topic, but we relate it to real world events in the here and now. As an example, uh, just uh, a month and a half ago, uh, a charlatan, a scam artist in the United Kingdom was sentenced to 17, 16, 17 years, whatever it was, in prison because he sold tens of millions of dollars worth of dowsing rods to the U.S. government, the U.K. government, and the Iraqi government for use at bomb checkpoints, but they were fake gizmos. They didn't even have any innards that connected uh, electronics. And uh, so this stuff has real world relevance. Uh, people who use these devices swear by them because these uh, free moving antennae seem to move on, the, on their own. Uh, but the psychologists know that this is really a physiological uh, effect where the, the person using the device unintentionally or unknowingly moves uh, the needle. This is the same thing that happens in uh, uh, Ouija boards, you know, moving a planchette. Uh, when you're talking maybe to dead people. So we connect the dots between these paranormal claims, uh, and we have a number of other resources, and uh, the methods and process of science. And if any of you want to be teachers or you know anyone who's 
doing homeschooling, you can get all of these resources for free online. We put on a big conference every year called The Amazing Meeting. James Randi is also known as The Amazing Randi. He was the magician for 60 years, The Amazing Randi. We put on a big conference that attracts you know, thousands of people over the years in Vegas and a lot of really fun and interesting celebrities. That's Penn and Teller. Bill Nye, the science guy, is one of our good friends and appears at our event. We have a lot of speakers. You'll recognize Neil deGrasse Tyson. Um, that's Adam Savage from Mythbusters. He's a close friend. So without doing a, a belabored sales pitch and commercial for the organization uh, I'm president of, I just want to tell you one other fun thing that we do, and that is we challenge paranormal claimants. Not only do we have a million dollars in the bank sequestered that we call the million dollar paranormal challenge so anyone can apply if they think they have magic or paranormal or supernatural abilities that they can demonstrate under mutually agreed upon test conditions they'll get the million not only is that available but sometimes we take the million to challenge claimants that we think are making claims that are harmful to society a recent example uh, and you could go to our YouTube channel online and see this viral video we did of this. There's this TV psychic named James Von Prague who says he could talk to dead people. He's been on Oprah and all these uh, uh, networks where he looks in an audience and he says, someone in your family has passed. And he says some things that really seem spookily specific about the uh, deceased loved ones. In fact, we think he's using magic tricks uh, something uh, called cold reading, which is a set of psychological manipulative techniques to only make it seem like he's saying specific things, but instead he's saying uh, many, many things. And because of our, how our brains are hardwired, uh, the, the audiences tend to only remember. It's called remembering the hits and forgetting the misses. And there are other methods there, too. So we challenged James Von Prague. We said, prove it and we'll give you a million dollars. He ignored us, he ignored the media when they contacted him. So we brought, remember he says he could talk to dead people, we brought some dead people to him. He did this in event in, he did an event in Southern California where he for a weekend had people come, spend gobs of money, hundreds of dollars to be reconnected with their dead loved ones. He ignored us, so we brought some dead people, I should actually say undead people, uh, to his event. We brought some zombies to James Von Prague's event uh, with a million dollars and uh, I won't belabor the point by showing you the video but you can find this viral video that got us attention in national media for this action and it, it admittedly is a sort of a stunt but we didn't go there to make fun of the believers who were there we went there to sort of put James Von Prague on the hot seat and to raise awareness about these I think very harmful claims the psychologists know a lot about what happens when you're grieving you go through stages of grief and we think what James Von Prague does is get people stuck in their grief and actually keeps them from overcoming and dealing with their loss. So it sort of boils our blood. We're doing this skepticism, in other words, in the public interest. It's not just about being smarty pants and hectoring people and telling people they're wrong, but it's about advancing critical thinking about these claims in order to help people. So a question to frame our discussion tonight. <coughs> I talked a bit about science. What would it be if you sort of used the spirit of science but when you're thinking about things that aren't just in test tubes when you're wearing lab coats, what would it be if you extend the spirit of science and critical thinking to deeply held convictions? I think at the very least, according to my definition, it would mean that you're a skeptic. Uh, if you want to put it in sort of philosophical, more robustly philosophical terms, it would be uh, embracing an outlook uh, called scientific naturalism or philosophical naturalism. Bertrand Russell, great uh, philosopher or a, a prominent philosopher, uh, I can't affect his high-pitched English accent, but he says you know, that it's undesirable to believe a proposition true when there's no evidence for it to be true. He goes on to say, and here's the turn, that this is a wildly paradoxical and even subversive idea because if you consistently apply this principle of skepticism it's going to necessarily overturn or undermine 
some of your most cherished and basic views about where you're at in the universe, about the, maybe the meaning of life, about metaphysics, about uh, really central beliefs. And a lot of people have central beliefs that would be undermined or overturned if you consistently apply skepticism. The vast majority of Americans believe in some aspect of the paranormal. 90 plus percent of Americans believe in God. Uh, 75 percent, three out of four people believe in some aspect of uh, you know, uh, ghosts or psychic powers or the ability for a witch to hex someone or UFOs or that sort of stuff. Um, and I think the antidote to that is skepticism, which is not the same thing as merely saying no to those what I think are unsupportable beliefs. Instead, it's a positive and, and constructive way of finding things out. The Greek word that we get the word skepticism from is skeptikos, which does not mean to deny or to be skeptical of. It just means to inquire, to find things out. And in that sense, skepticism is continuous with the project of science. It's a way, maybe the best way, of finding things out, looking at evidence. It's not just in a knee-jerk way saying no to beliefs. It also, as I mentioned earlier, has, a, I'd argue, a real world, a relevant agenda. I mentioned those bomb detectors that the guy sold for $36,000 each to the governments of Iraq, uh, the UK, and... and uh, uh, United States, it took a magician. It took James Randi to take the darn thing apart and say, this is fake. This is a magic trick, and to explain it. So skepticism, in that sense, uh, has uh, real-world consequences. You might even be so grandiose as to say skepticism can save lives. You know, there are folks who argue that vaccines cause autism, and therefore you shouldn't vaccinate your children. But that unsupportable claim has real-world negative health consequences if it's widely adopted. Uh, there are uh, many other examples. So I'm interested in, in the application of the science and reason stuff to cherish beliefs. In other words, I'm interested in the implications of scientific naturalism, which I'll define for purposes of our discussions uh, tonight on ethics as having uh, you know, three characteristics, three components, three parts of the definition. One, it's a way of finding things out. I mentioned skepticism, skepticos, as a way of finding things out. It's also relevant to understanding our place in the universe, so you could say cosmic worldview. And for our purposes tonight, it, uh, I think it has implications for our understanding of ethics. So quickly, uh, to go through the first two components as a method of inquiry, it says basically, you know, what I quoted Bertrand Russell as pushing. You should only believe stuff for which there's good evidence. You should only assent to those propositions that have ade adequate grounds for assent. As a worldview, it posits that all there is in the universe is the universe. There's no super universe. There's no beyond the universe. There's no bifurcating of the world into the natural and then the supernatural, or you might say subnatural. You know, it's only the natural world. The bad news is, as a cosmic worldview, there is a lot of cultural competition <laughs> for naturalism. There are the supernaturalists and I'd say the paranormalists. So not only the people who believe in ancient religions, but the p people who believe in ghosts and magic and, and spirits and psychic powers, they, be, they go beyond the uh, methods of science uh, to probe transcendental realms. And then, since we're at a university, I have to mention there, are, there is a category of inquirer uh, that are called postmodernists. These are sort of radical skeptics. They take the sort of skepticism I was talking about earlier, and they really go to town. They go to the wall with it, and uh, they sort of um, question whether or not anything is uh, true. They say maybe that science is one mythic narrative among many others. Um, and uh, we reject both of those kinds of cultural competition to naturalism. Uh, but I'm here tonight to talk really about ethics. Uh, so the question to ask is, can this point of view provide us with 
ethical principles? Can we derive notions of right and wrong that inspire enough <coughs> commitment to give the older notions of right and wrong posited on supernaturalism a run for their money? In other words, uh, can naturalism, this sort of skeptical project, answer the basic questions, what's the meaning of life? How ought I to live? How do I know right from wrong? Is it possible to move beyond the ancient received wisdoms uh, that are based on faith or emotion, custom, authority, uh, and instead apply reason to ethics? And we say, um, of course, uh, ethics is amenable to reason. Uh, the sort of uh, to tell you the end of my conversation tonight at the beginning, um, you know, the argument is that ethics precedes religion. It, it doesn't follow religious belief. And since we're going to get into it, I, uh, I just want to say uh, uh, quickly that years ago, as I started thinking about these issues, I had great conversations and arguments at the Center for Inquiry, which Dan mentioned, with my buddy then Austin Dacey, and he helped me do a lot of the thinking here um, uh, help me clarify through argument uh, earlier versions of this talk. So thank you, Austin. Of course, there are a lot of other thinkers in this arena, and may maybe we'll unpack some of that too. Peter Singer, and uh, the, I mean, there there are folks that no philosopher seems to like, but you know, Sam Harris and other folks who are also dabbling in these topics. So I'm going to talk about ethics, or more broadly, science and ethics. Uh, or you could frame it as godless. That sounds a little scary and ominous. Godless morality. So questions for you to consider. Um, can you be good without being religious? How do we get those values? How do we get those notions of right and wrong? What does av evolution have to say about right and wrong? And that's going to be the, the meat of uh, our conversation tonight. And you know, then other related questions. Does religion uh, give us a better ethics than secular or uh, these, these ways of thinking about right and wrong that might be derived from or at least informed by evolutionary thinking, Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection. Science tells us, uh, this is sort of a, a big claim here, science tells us most of the things we know about the world. Now, you have a lot of uh, humanists of the academic variety who say, oh, not so. You, do, you don't want to reduce everything down to science. But the stuff that we know that we know, we get from science, you know, uh, and, and that horizon uh, uh, of that category of what we know about the world has been steadily growing since the, revolu the scientific revolutions. Science is, uh, as an example, beginning to tell us something about the causes of homosexuality, right? But can science tell us being gay is okay? Or do we get the okay from someplace other than science? Or science can tell us something about uh, the development of a fetus, but can science tell us abortion is all right at a certain phase of the fetus's development? Science says one thing, uh, uh, morality generally is thought to say another thing, and hence we have these culture wars. So the big question, can there be a science of ethics? Does evolution tell us right from wrong? Can we figure out right from wrong on our own without recourse to supernatural religion or the divine? Well, I said ethics is amenable to reason, and uh, so let's start at the beginning of this conversation. Adam and Eve. They actually, you know, if, whether or not you believe the account, you look at it literarily, uh, they got in big trouble for asking this question. They ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You'll remember that's what got them kicked out of the Garden of Eden. They deigned to figure it out on their own, right and wrong. They tried to figure out right and wrong by themselves, and this angered God. He wanted to sort of keep that knowledge to himself for whatever reason, but it was Adam and Eve taking it upon themselves to discover right and wrong that got them expelled. And obviously, there's no going back to Eden, right? There's no... Um, return to Eden, we're stuck outside of that place of sort of being idyllic and naive about right and wrong. 
uh, uh, now we have to ponder these questions ourselves. That, re that uh, leads me to one of my points. I'm going to argue, yes, you can be good without God, without belief in God. Not that there is a God and we could sort of ignore what he says and be good anyway. I'm going to say you can be good without belief in God, that you can be motivated. You could have good reasons to be good without believing in God. And that, that motivation, that justification can be based in the natural world, in the real world. There can be evidence-based arguments for um, your positions on right and wrong. I'll go to argue that belief in God may actually make it harder for you to be good. That if you believe in God, it may actually stunt your moral development. It may be bad for your moral, your ethical health. And I'm going to explore what we think evolution, Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection, may say about morality and why what it may say is worth paying attention to. So uh, in the simplest uh, way of, the, of the, uh, that first point, uh, we, we should sort of think of the two ways can you be good without God can be formulated, can be interpreted. One way of seeing the question is to ask literally, can people do good things even if they're atheists? And the other way, obviously, is, and I think this is much more interesting, merits our attention much more, uh, can people have philosophical justifications for being good without believing in a divine foundation for morality? In other words, are there atheistic or scientific or evolutionary-based reasons, naturalistic reasons, for ethical be behavior. So the first thing, obviously, I think it's also sort of uncontroversial, you can do good things, you can be a good person without believing in God. In the, in the last 15 years, I've met and worked with a whole lot of, you know, dirty little atheists who happen to be really nice folks, and, you know, they'd, uh, you know, they'd watch your house if you go out on vacation, they're not going to steal your stuff, they're good, good people. Um, it, but they don't believe in God as lawgiver. They don't believe in God as the source of morality. Um, quick example, you remember a number of years ago, there was this act of God, the tsunami in Asia, that killed uh, hundreds of thousands of people. You remember this? Well, atheists in America got together, and through a, a charity, they all raised hundreds of thousands of dollars to help those people on the other side of the planet. And they did that not because God said, but because there was sort of a human need. And they said, hey, we're rich Westerners. Let's pull our resources. Let's help out. So uncontroversially, um, you know, we, we can be good without God. Um, millions of Americans believe in right and wrong, but don't believe in God. As an example, 60% of American scientists are atheists, are unbelievers. 93% of the best scientists in the United States are atheists. These are members of the National Academies of Sciences, etc. So the cream of the crop scientists, they are not religious, but you don't hear stories in the media of there's another scientist on the loose. You know, there's another National Academy of Sciences member who did that armed robbery or committed that crime or did that immoral act. Uh, for the first time in polling data history, uh, over 10% of Americans explicitly identified as atheist, and a, almost 16% of, uh, of Americans in polling data are identifying as like non-religious or unchurched. Doesn't mean they're all atheists, but it means they're not, you know, devout believers in some supernatural uh, deity. So. That's sort of obvious. You can be good without God in that sense. But should we conclude that these people can't actually be good, like they're deceiving themselves or something, because they don't have God? Of course not. So that leads us to that second way of uh, uh, thinking about uh, can you be good without God, and that's to look at the question, can you be good without God um, on good grounds? Can you have good reasons? Why should someone be moral even if there is no God or they don't believe in God? Is Dostoevsky right in Brothers Karamazov that without God, if God doesn't exist, therefore 
everything is permissible. Since there's no lawgiver, there's no uh, eye in the sky, does that uh, result in a sort of moral nihilism where all bets are off and everyone can just do what they want? Are there philosophically or even scientifically justifiable reasons for being good in a universe where God is absent? So I'll argue, sort of a no-brainer, of course there are, and I'm going to go so far as to say that Darwin's theory of evolution may actually suggest some of those reasons. We're taught when we learn biology that nothing in biology makes sense unless you buy the theory of evolution. It's so explanatory. It's sort of, it's sort of the uh, coherent narrative that makes sense of all of biology. We are biological creatures. To understand Homo sapiens, you need to understand biology. And to understand biology, you need to understand <coughs> evolution. But we're not just biological creatures. We are moral creatures. Uh, th by that I mean, you know, we judge our actions in terms of the moral rightness or wrongness of them. And we sort of do that naturally or intuitively. You hear a toddler on the playground you know, exclaim that when the, that other kid treated him unfairly, that it was unfair, that it was wrong. So, um, you know, we're, we're, we're sort of moral de facto, uh, or in a de facto sense. We feel guilty when we hurt someone else uh, or we do something wrong. So, might it be true that we can only understand morality because we're moral, uh, homo sapiens are moral creatures, that we can only understand morality in light of evolution? Well, Charles Darwin himself may have thought so. In The Origin of Species, um, in Origin of Species, he said, uh, or he sort of prophesied that psychology is going to be placed on a new foundation, that light's going to be thrown on the origins of man, and not just as a physical creature, but in all aspects of man, uh, his psychology, in other words. In Descent of Man, he talked about the connections between moral behavior in people and social behavior in higher primates, like the great apes. And today, many scientifically-minded folks, such as Steven Pinker, the Har Harvard cognitive scientist, or maybe if you, if you want to insult him, you'll call him an evolutionary uh, psychologist. Um, the psychologist Mark Hauser, maybe you don't mention him, he got in some, some trouble. But there are a lot of thinkers who think that evolutionary biology may actually provide a foundation for ethics or at the very least inform our understanding of ethics and morality. But on the other hand, even in Charles Darwin's day and up until today, up until right now, there are people who maintain that evolution is actually the antithesis of morality, that if you believe in evolution, it means you're going to be evil. In fact, they, you know, in some ser sermons, you can hear about the evil of evolution, not evolution, right? That's not just an English accent. That's like Jerry Falwell. That's a certain sti stripe of uh, religious believer. Religious political activists have argued publicly and in their organizing <laughs> literature like the Wedge document at the Discovery Institute or, or uh, other sort of organizing documents, that if students learn the theory of evolution, it's a domino effect and it's going to uh, mean the demise of our ethics and morality in our culture. That evolution is nothing but a conspiracy of the elites to undermine family values, to promote a hedonistic, a morality-free society, and as I mentioned, Pat Robertson, Jimmy Swaggart, so many others, Creflo Dollar, one of my favorite guys on TV, uh, they talk about evolution. They say that if you believe in the theory of evolution, you cannot believe in the kind of right and wrong that matters. You certainly won't believe in the kind of right and wrong set out in the Bible or a kind of right and wrong that rings true to most people on the planet. So of these two perspectives, who's right? Can we learn something about right and wrong from evolution? Or is learning evolution going to make you completely confused and wrongheaded about right and wrong? So uh, this is a sort of philosophy series. Uh, I have to stand true to that. And, the, and therefore, the answer to that question, who's right, is both of them a little bit, right? So the, uh, like a lot of philosophers, the answer to tough questions is yes and no. And so uh, let's... Uh, uh, unpack that. They're both right, they're both wrong, 
and in interesting ways. So I'm going to argue for the following claims today. That evolutionary science, Darwinism, can indeed help explain ethics, but it can't alone justify our sense of right and wrong. But neither can it invalidate ethics. Evolution can, can't prove ethical views to be right or wrong all by itself. I'm going to argue that the act of justifying ethics, in other words, arguing with warrants or good reasons uh, uh, why your ethical positions are justifiable, it requires something more than just a scientific understanding of evolution. It requires like a critical reflection or a philosophical inquiry into these claims, uh, uh, a reflection, a, a critical <coughs> rationality into who and what we are, what matters to us. Uh, it, so the, what's inherent in that is that uh, moral knowledge is discoverable. That's sort of uh, something I'm going to argue today. It's not something that has to be received uh, from ancient wisdom, but it's something we can find out. Young people can find out what's right and wrong in objective ways. And I'm going to uh, also argue for the uh, position that mere, obviously, mere knowledge of evolution does not make people less moral. That sounds maybe uncontroversial in a philosophy series, but it's a widely argued belief in vast swaths of American culture. So quickly, what do I mean by justify? To justify something is just give good reasons for it, you know, so you have some sound uh, reason for having uh, the position, to offer good reasons or warrants or vindication for the position. It's not the same thing that, you know, like your mom would say, don't, you know, I don't need to hear those justifications. Like it's not giving excuses for, right? It's, it's giving good reasons for. It's not just giving an explanation. Instead, it's giving an account um, of why you have good reasons for that position. An example, uh, take, say, from Star Wars, right? Um, big pop culture guy, go to Comic-Con every year. Uh, if you can't learn it from Star Wars or Star Trek, might not be worth learning, but don't tell I sa said that to the philosophy professors. Um, we can explain, if you know the Star Wars story, if you've watched all the good and bad movies in the Star Wars series, we get how Darth Vader became Darth Vader, right? You can sort of see how, you know, he was Annie and then see these things happened and he turned into Darth Vader. How he became a bad guy. We can explain it. But understanding how he became a bad guy in no sense justifies how he became a bad guy. So justification is the good reasons for, not just an explanation for. We could also justify Yoda's good behavior, like we know, uh, we can argue for why Yoda's being a good guy without knowing a whit about his background. Like, I don't know where he came from, I don't know what sort of little species he is and how he could bounce around so much, but I know that he's a good guy, right? And uh, so you don't need to explain how he got to be a good guy to know that he's a good guy. Um, so another way to put these arguments, evolution might tell us how we are, might even tell us how it is impossible for us to ever be. It might say, you know, it's just not on the cards, you can't be that way, because, uh, you know, evolution can explain something about our hardwiring maybe. But it can't alone tell us how we ought to be. For that, we must consult reason and sort of philosophical or scientific inquiry, something called conscience, I'll unpack, critical intelligence. In other words, the application of reason to human experience, applying this spirit of science, which is a kind of experiment. You know, it's testing things by their consequences in the real world. And I, I mean by that discovering right and wrong without looking to divine command or God or what some ancient book says uh, instead, you have to test actions by their consequences in the real world. So I'll get to that in a minute. So a lot of folks on both sides of this issue think that evolution is somehow relevant to the discussion, whether or not you say evolution makes you evil, evolution, or you say evolution, uh, you can derive right from wrong from it, or at least it can inform the conversation. Uh, well, why is that? That's because evolution does actually show us something about how we got to be this way. Moral, in other words. 
um, how we became ethical animals, or at least the ethical animals that we think we, we are. As an example, look at social cooperation. What's the evolution of that? You know, amoeba, uh, we don't think of amoeba as being moral uh, or ethical, but if you look at how we've evolved, you say we somehow evolved to be this way. Evolution in a neo-Darwinian picture is variation, natural selection, adaptation, and in our case, our environment that for tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of years, our environment as people is other people. So uh, social cooperation, the evolutionary uh, thinkers believe evolved. Uh, Pro-social behavior evolved. Examples include uh, reciprocal altruism, you scratch my back and I'll scratch yours, or certain norms surrounding sexuality, uh, xenophobia, fear of other people, the stranger, the people in the other tribe, the people outside of your kind and kin, um, or various moral emotions, which we can see analogs of in the social primates, like revenge or jealousy or duty and obligation, guilt, sense of fairness, all of that stuff. So evolution uh, tells us a bit about how we got all those things in our uh, brains. We can use evolution to explain something about where those moral intuitions, that moral sense came from. And it's natural, it's not supernatural. But note that I'm not arguing right now that evolution tells us that our general, general morality, the way we are as we interact with people, is the right one to have. I'm not arguing that evolution justifies it, but it explains something about how we uh, got to be this way. In other words, it evolved. Now, this is, this is uh, sort of going to blow your mind. You can use the same sort of inquiry that I'm talking about to actually be skeptical of the categories of right and wrong. So let's call this evolutionary skepticism. We can be skeptical about ethics and human morality in the first place, and there are a couple ways of doing this. Uh, some thinkers conclude that since ethical behavior is just adaptive behavior, like any other behavior, that it's not really ethical in the sense it's worth caring about. In other words, this is like an evolutionary skepticism about ethics that says, uh, I'm going to use evolution to contend that ethics isn't actually what people say it is. It's not actually ethics. It's just like selfish behavior that's wrapped up into seeming altruistic. It's you know, enlightened self-interest or whatever. And there are two versions of this. One is, as I uh, uh, mentioned, uh, that the moral sense is merely an, an adaptation. Um, our sense of moral rightness and wrongness is just uh, evolved and designed through evolution to help us survive in a certain kind of environment, which includes other people. It like it helps us get on in life. That re reciprocal altruism is not actually ethical. It's just a way to transact with other people, to smooth uh, over the rough edges, help us sort of fare in the world a, a, a bit better. E.O. Wilson sort of argues for this uh, in some sense. So, um, you know, you, you could sort of, uh, as an as a analogy, um, look at the evolution of why some things smell bad to us, right? Uh, so in that sense, they say, oh, your moral sense is just like your sense of what smells bad. You, we don't like doing those behaviors, just like we don't like those smells. Um, not because there's actually any rightness or wrongness to them, but you know, it sort of serves our evolutionary purposes. Uh, um, you know, th like w we evolved in a certain kind of environment um, that believing X is wrong helped us survive evolutionarily, just like um, we evolved in a certain kind of environment that uh, made us think that bad smell is wrong, maybe because it's dangerous or something. Um, as an example, we don't make it our practice to dig dung, right? That's not a human project. But dung beetles dig dung. Dung beetles are all about digging dung. But no one says to the dung beetle, you're wrong to dig dung, right? Because the dung beetle sort of adapted to do that. And we, this argument says, we adapted to think, well, it's wrong to 
to steal because it's sort of you know, society does, groups don't work well together if that happens. The response, though, is of course the kinds of things that we value depend on the kinds of things that we are. We're people, and we value the things people value. That's sort of a uh, you know a, an obvious. Uh, uh, statement. Lots of our faculties are evolved, but that doesn't show that the, their objects, the objects of the, those faculties, are not actually there in the real world. An example here is sight. We evolved eyeballs to see things because there was an evolutionary advantage or whatever, but we're actually seeing real things in the real world. Um, just because we evolve sight as an adaptation to help us survive doesn't mean the stuff we're seeing is any less real. Evolved faculties can indeed connect us with objective real facts in the real world. And I'll argue, I think we'll have time, that there, are, there, there is a thing called an objective moral fact. There are moral, there's moral knowledge and that moral knowledge is in no sense, this is a sort of a strong claim to get the philosophers riled up, but moral knowledge is in no sense different than any other kind of knowledge. It's discoverable in the real world. So another kind of uh, skepticism about ethics, using evolution to fuel that skepticism, goes this way. Well, evolution actually made us all sort of selfish, egoistic. Uh, you know, the, the popular way of thinking about this is survival of the fittest. You know, we're all just, it's for me and mine and that cooperation is just illusory. It's actually just self-interest, but on a deeper level. Uh, so let's just suppose that it were true psychologically that we tend to be egoists, that we tend to only really care about ourselves, even if we lie to ourselves in the process. Does, if that's true, does it make it correct that it's true? Does it make it morally justifiable? If we're all egoist, egoists, is egoism justified? So back in the day, especially my last year of Bible college, I would tend to stay up late at night over drinks, right? Have great rows, great conversations, arguments, but just because that happened to be the case, does it justify it? Just So if we imagine that it happens to be the case that we're egoists, does that mean it's right to be egoists? Uh, so uh, if I belabor this point, I'm going to go on and on and on, but does that mean just because I'm going to go on and on that, it, that I'm justified in going on and on? The answer is no. Uh, I'll, gi I'll give you that answer. There will be a quiz. So uh, the, the response here is that, look, even if egoism is an accurate description of who we are, it wouldn't justify egoism as an ethical doctrine. Uh, again, egoism is not just saying people are selfish but it's saying that people ought to be selfish. That's egoism as sort of an ethical position, uh, that we ought to act out of only self-interest. And you have some like pseudo-economic thinkers, or you might say quasi, if you want to be generous, economic thinkers, who prize this sort of selfishness. And they say it's actually bad if you're altruistic. Uh, so there's a fundamental distinction uh, and in philosophy. You're, you've heard this, that is ought stuff. Uh, between explaining the way our behavior is and justifying the way that our behavior is. Evolution made people many things that, we ca that I don't think we can justify on moral grounds. It made us selfish, but it also made us afraid of strangers, may maybe made us prone to violence, uh, e even if we're less violent now than we've ever been. You listen to Pinker in his great uh, book, Better Angels. Um, uh, so just describing the way we are doesn't mean it's the way we should be. Uh, here's an important side note, uh, because I uh, conversation earlier today, I know some folks are, are aware of like Dawkins' argument about the selfish gene, right? That is actually unrelated to the kind of psychological selfishness I was talking about. It's not saying, oh, since we have selfish genes, then we ought to be egoistic or selfish ourselves. Uh, that's sort of... Um, just a gene's eye view of uh, evolution. I just wanted to clarify because I, you know, maybe people get hung up um, on that point. It may have been in the interest of our genes to make us, in fact, altruistic. Maybe it gets our genes out there more for us to be genuinely altruistic. Is is that point? So, I just, in my cursory way, rebutted um, 
two kinds of skeptical conclusions about eth ethics that use evolutionary thinking to be skeptical. Um, but what about folks who, who derive more favorable conclusions about ethics, also using evolution? Uh, like the principle of the golden rule. You know, there are evolutionary thinkers who actually, like, they defend the golden rule. You know, do unto others only as you have them do unto you. And they use, like, evolutionary arguments describing uh, how we might have evolved uh, to commend that point of view. I'm thinking of, like my, someone mentioned earlier in that seminar uh, a couple hours ago, Michael Shermer, his book, Science of Good and Evil, or Steven Pinker's The Blank Slate. He sort of com commends the idea of the golden rule. Doesn't say God says. He says there are other good reasons, uh, if you look at evolution, to sort of commend this notion of the golden rule. Or even Richard Dawkins in The God Delusion, this big, great atheist book that's a mega bestseller, he speaks highly of the golden rule. Who would have thunk? I've always been, personally, as an aside, a bigger fan of what they call, what do they call it, the, like the silver rule or whatever, the, like, um, you know, the notion, uh, was it Confucius's formulation or somebody, uh, don't do unto others what you don't want them to do to you, as opposed to do unto others. Because one is acting on someone else, and I, I sort of probably just, temperamentally or constitutionally, like the idea of people leaving each other or at least me alone. Anyway, uh, so um, people are arguing that you can derive ethical principles uh, from uh, uh, understanding our evolved human nature. But just as with those folks who use evolution to argue against ethics, same sort of problem if you use evolution to argue for certain ethical principles. We can always ask, fine, it's evolved, no big whoop, but is, does that mean it's right? Maybe we evolved to be cooperative, mutual, mutual reciprocity, golden rule, maybe that is hardwired, but it doesn't mean that it's the right way to be, be, uh, behave or to believe. So, um, This, uh, this sort of thinking is problematic um, because uh, you know, it's, it's not the case that just because uh, we evolved to have the golden rule, it's necessarily going to be the right way to behave. We could come up with counterexamples. An example, hypothetically, where if you consistently apply the golden rule, it's going to, on the face of it, be wrong. Think of the very consistent car thief you know, who Rather than you know just stealing, you know, your car, you know he's, you know he's going to uh, uh, n not not steal just a stranger's car, but only steal the stranger's car who's asking for it, right? Or the consistent Nazi who discovers, doggone it, I'm actually Jewish, so he exterminates himself, right? We can come up with counterexamples where the golden rule consistently applied is still wrong. Uh, evolution is um, uh, messy. Uh, and just because uh, something evolved doesn't mean uh, it's the uh, sort of right way to behave necessarily. When people create something, when we do the project of inventing something, we try to devise the best design in advance and then build the thing according to that design. Uh, but natural selection, which is the main engine driving evolution, maybe there's a couple other things going on there, but the main engine natural selection instead is incredibly in, uh, inefficient. It creates by randomly trying a huge number of possibilities and only those that work stick. Uh, um, so if we were trying to evolve the, the right way to behave, it would be like the person who attempts to build a bridge by randomly trying every possible configuration of a bridge and then letting it collapse until through dumb luck one bridge stands. And then we say, Eureka, we figured out how to do a bridge. But that's not how we design bridges. And that's how, I'd argue, uh, uh, that's not how we derive uh, or figure out uh, right and wrong. Um, additionally, because evolution must, uh, let me get back to that, because evolution must operate by making gradual modifications 
to pre-existing structures, it leaves organisms with many traits that are functionally useless. So maybe some of our moral intuitions are just leftovers from, bio, uh, from biological evolution and actually not the right way to behave. Uh, uh, lastly, evolution is really cruel. If evolution is a game with only one rule, uh, in other words, survive, pass your genes on, uh, then you should have more kids than your neighbor by any means necessary, and we don't really think of that as an ethical position. Uh, most of us don't. Uh, most of us don't. So where does that leave us? How do we figure it out then? If you're not going to if, uh, conclude that uh, ethics is wrong by evolution, and you're not going to use evolution to figure out what's right, um, then... Uh, how do we figure it out? So evolution may explain our behavior. I've been arguing that it doesn't alone justify our behavior. It doesn't explain how we should live in a robust way. Um, I've also suggested that because evolution doesn't tell us right from wrong, you don't need to look to God to figure out right from wrong. So wh where are we left standing? Let's talk about critical rationality. Uh, philosophical inquiry. That's uh, the big kahuna. That's how we're going to figure out uh, in compelling, persuasive, justifiable ways uh, our positions on right and wrong. In Western culture, uh, moral duties have been uh, associated you know, for a good long time with rules and rule givers. God giving us the Ten Commandments, that's sort of the archetype. You know, how do you know right from wrong? Look at the scrolls, look at the tablets, right? Um, but according to this model, morality, moral action, is only the kind of stuff that follows the rules. But we know, uh, even good Bible believers, have a much more common sense understanding of morality, which begins with the fact the objective out in the world real fact that some things in life to us have overriding special value. There are things that ethicists call moral goods. These are the things that have overriding value. So the moral life will consist in living in ways that increase moral goods and prevent call moral bads, right? And though this is not consensus, you'll have some philosophers in the room may have a different ethical view, the sort of um, position I just described, which is maximizing moral goods, is a kind of utilitarianism called consequentialism. And uh, the one I favor these days is called well-being consequentialism, which goes something like this. In your case, you know that your well-being is good, like you like your well-being, right? And that's sort of uncontroversial. Um, by and large, healthy person likes his well-being, her well-being. The fact that it's your well-being is irrelevant to, the, to whether or not it's good. It's good not because it's yours, but because it's good. Well-being is good. So the well-being, you could sort of broaden that. You say the well-being of everybody is good. Everybody's well-being is a moral good that you should maximize. Goods ought to be promoted, therefore. And therefore, then to conclude this well-being consequentialism says, therefore, the well-being of everybody ought to be promoted. And notice in that little conversation, God is not mentioned anywhere. No one says, be good because God says. Instead, you start with your well-being and you sort of universalize it. So... You've heard uh, uh, what I've heard a ton, this phrase, what would Jesus do? By the way, if any of you are superstitious enough to conclude accurately, as it turns out, that that uh, noise is a function of someone higher up not liking the content of this talk, please don't tell Dr. Dimitriou because he's akin to only have theists come speak to you from now on. Oh, so, okay, so uh, if... If this is not your favorite subject, now is the time to elegantly make your exit uh, while we're making a break. Okay, thanks, guys, for that. 
What would Jesus do? That's what a lot of uh, uh, evangelical folks especially sort of organize their ethical thinking about. If they want to know if something's right from wrong, they ask the question, what would Jesus do? WWJD. You've seen the t-shirts, the bracelets, etc. I think a more important question is not what Jesus would do, but why Jesus would do it. It's not like Jesus said in the Gospels, let he who is good at sin cast the first stone, right? He didn't say that. Instead, he said, he who is without sin cast the first stone. So if he said one thing and not the other thing, we can sort of conclude that he had a reason to say it one way over the other way. He must have had a reason for saying, let he who is without sin cast the first stone instead of the opposite. And if there are reasons, moral reasons, they're independent of like his choices or his preferences or whatever. He had reasons uh, for that position. He must have had good rational reasons for his moral positions. I'm, I'm uh, so, sort of playing with this idea. So the question is not what would Jesus do, but why would Jesus do what Jesus would do? WWJD, WJWD, <laughs> right? So put that on your t-shirt, right? That's the acronym I want evangelical Christians to start putting on their bracelets. Why is Jesus saying it this way and not that way? The view that you need God as a foundation for morality flies in the face of established ethical theory. Uh, You don't just do what you're told because God says. God says it. This is the old euthyphro thing, philosophy, students, you're familiar. God says to do it because it's right. You know, so it's not arbitrary, it's not just God saying it. The existence of of objective moral values does not demand the existence of God. So um, where are we at with all of this? To to sort of begin um, framing the, the conclusion of our time together, if we don't need religion to figure out right from wrong, does evolution suggest instead that we're just fixed in a battle for the survival of the fittest, that ethics doesn't even enter into it, that it's a war of all against all. This is a slide of Bruegel's 16th century etching entitled, Big Fish Eat Small. Big Fish Eat Small. David Hume uh, summed up this idea, you know, survival of the fittest, sort of this red in tooth and claw, a, a natural world sort of idea. In his dialogues concerning natural religion, he said, a perpetual war is kindled amongst all living creatures. Necessity, hunger, want, stimulate the strong and the courageous. Fear, anxiety, terror, agitate the weak and infirm. The strong prey upon the weaker and keep them in perpetual terror and anxiety. The weaker, too, in their turn, prey upon The stronger, they sort of come together and prey on the stronger and vex and molest them without relaxation. They sort of team up. And thus, on each hand, before and behind, above and below, every animal is surrounded with enemies which incessantly seek his misery and destruction. The whole presents nothing but the idea of a blind nature impregnated by a great vivifying principle and pouring forth from her lap without discernment or parental care, her maimed and abortive children. So that's a really optimistic view of our place in nature, (laughs) right? Uh, Thomas Huxley had a sort of rejoinder to that, uh, later echoed by some other uh, evolutionary thinkers. You know Thomas Huxley, T.H. Huxley, is Darwin's bulldog, big defender of uh, evolution. And other folks, philosophers, uh, uh, Philip Kitcher, uh, Peter Singer, others, uh, counter this view of our place in nature. And they say, okay, fine. This is Huxley now. The practice of that which is ethically best, what we call goodness or virtue, involves a course of conduct which, in all respects, is actually opposed to that which leads to success in the great cosmic struggle for existence. In place of ruthless self-assertion, it demands self-restraint. In place of thrusting aside or treading down all competitors, it requires that the individual shall not merely respect, but shall help his fellows. 
its influence is directed not so much to the survival of the fittest as to the fitting of as many people as possible to survival. So is it evolution after all? If you look at uh, evolution in red and tooth and claw, all of the, you know, 99% of all species that have ever been on the planet have actually gone extinct. Uh, if evolution is so nasty, um, what about the, pl the claim popularized in the 1920s by William Jennings Bryant, Bryan, that mere knowledge of evolution encourages immoral behavior? You know, knowing that it's red and tooth and claw, is that sort of going to make you a nihilist and go out and be red and tooth and claw? That's a fun empirical question. It's a testable question. It'd be uh, easy to have lots of sociolo sociological data. Um, you can actually take a stab at answering that question by looking at Darwin's homeland, England, where evolution is widely believed, not so in the United States. 80% of people in, in uh, Britain believe in evolution compared with just about 25% of people in the United States. Yet their rates of social dysfunction, such as murder, rape, drug abuse, poverty, are all far, far lower than in the United States. They have a higher standard of living. They do a lot better job caring for their elderly. Uh, they, they've extended the right to vote to women uh, earlier than in the United States. Uh, you know, they're pro-gay marriage, all these sorts of uh, movements of, for, for civil rights and rights of uh, uh, minorities uh, adopted there earlier. So it suggests at least that belief in evolution is not itself enough to debase an otherwise civilized society. This is a close-up of Bruegel's etching that I just pointed out. Evolution about human nature, I'm uh, sorry, evidence about human nature from the evolutionary sciences does have a lot of explanatory value. It says a lot about how we got to be this way. But it can't alone justify, nor can it undermine our ethical claims and principles. When you're going to find behavior to be justifiable, uh, there's nothing better than critical rationality, than sort of thinking things through and coming up with warrants and reasons for consulting our conscience, our critical intelligence. And I'd argue that that trumps religion every single time. We can discover right and wrong by the application of reason to our behavior, by, in other words, looking at the consequences in the real world. Is it working for you? Is it causing harm? Is it helping people? Um, that's that well-being consequentialism I talked about uh, briefly. Before publishing Origin of Species, Darwin wrote to his friend Joseph Hooker that telling the world about the theory of evolution actually was really hard for him to do. He said, it, it's, it feels like confessing to a murder. That's Darwin's words. Telling the world about evolution by natural selection felt like he was confessing to a murder. Darwin had found out the real explanation for how the world came to be and how it continues to be through the struggle for existence, speciation, extinction. For, for Darwin, the secret was a terrible secret. Knowing how we actually got here was terrible because it would necessarily overturn a lot of central beliefs. It was going to turn a lot of people against him. It was going to destroy and unsettle so much of the culture of his day, of our day. But it was also terrible, not just because of the sort of social consequences. You know, it's hard to be popular at a cocktail party if you're jutting against everyone's, you know, happy views. But it was, it was terrible because what it revealed about nature itself, that we live in the midst of this big, messy, bloody battle for survival, which was begun and which can be stopped by no one. Like, even if we remove ourselves from the picture, evolution is you know, going to go on unless we so damage the planet that all life goes away, which is highly unlikely. We, may, we might not be here, but life is still going to be around. So that big struggle is evolution by natural selection. So is Darwin actually a prophet of doom? Is he this big naysayer? 
I, rather than thinking of him as a prophet of doom, I think of him as that little wizened man in Bruegel's etching. That he's pointing out to the world the way it really is, the true spectacle of natural history. Behold, Darwin says, like this wizened man, Maybe he does it to inspire awe. Maybe he's just a natural scientist, wants us to get how it really is. Maybe he's promoting sort of an appreciation of the tragic irony of it all. But he isn't trying to get us only to admire the brute facticity of bloody nature, of our existence, but to instruct us. He says, this, you know, big fish eat small, is where we came from. But let's let science and reason, let's let critical rationality help us make sure we never go back there. And so that's why evolution is not enough to tell us how to be moral. It certainly doesn't undermine our ethics. But to figure out right from wrong, we need this uh, critical rationality, the project that you're engaged in in this series. So thank you very much.